the latest vessel from Lothal's Imperial Shipyards, the Sinar Systems Advanced TIE Starfighter. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to be a complete breakdown of the Grand Inquisitor's TIE Advanced V1 prototype. All TIEs are built by Sinar Fleet Systems, and this version was directly based off the Scimitar, used most famously by Darth Maul. And similarly, this V1 was used by the third in line to the Sith Master, as Darth Plagueis was the one that recommended Palpatine give it to his assassin, Maul. Like how the Grand Inquisitor was beneath Vader, with the latter using the TIE Advanced X1, also a prototype. But before I jump into the breakdown, I want to thank Morning Brew for sponsoring this video. They have solved a problem I've been thinking about for a while. You want to stay informed, but so many traditional news outlets resort to clickbait, they bury the lead, or hide the nuance for the final paragraph. While other social media sites can lead to endless scrolling, really throwing off your morning routine. Start your day off with Morning Brew. It only takes a few seconds to sign up for, and every morning they will email you a succinct but effective dose of information, getting you up to speed on business, finance, tech, and other things. The newsletter is split into chunks, and it only takes about 5 minutes to read. I caught up on the once in 500 years flood event behind the Yellowstone washout, how mortgage rates jumped to the highest level since 2008, and there's even more lighthearted stuff like the Dolly mini AI generated absurd pics that you're seeing all over the internet. Again, it is a completely free newsletter, takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe to, and will be a much more enjoyable way to check in on the world without the endless scrolling. So sign up today for free using morningbrewdaily.com slash metanerds, or click on that link in the description. Let's get back to the video. The TIE Fighter would completely replace the ARC-170 and ETA-2 by around 5 years after the war, the year 14 BBY, and by 5 BBY, the V1 was officially introduced to the public during the Empire Day celebration on Lothal, celebrating the day that the Clone Wars ended and the Empire began. Pretty, isn't it? Yeah, I almost feel bad about blowing it up. While this particular one was destroyed by the rebel group, the Spectres, the Grand Inquisitor had been using one for some time by now. One of the most obvious differences is the wing shape and this folding feature. These solar energy collectors folding down serve the practical purpose of lowering the cockpit to allow the pilot to more comfortably enter, removing the need for the usual infrastructure you see with TIE hangars which best case in capital ships took the form of catwalks from which the ties would hang, so the pilot could just drop in that top hatch. And they would build things like this in some bases on planets, or like we see with the First Order, they had these stackable racks and all of them were accessed by stairs on the side, while at the very most minimal you would have to have these movable stairs. So bringing that cockpit down is actually pretty practical for an Inquisitor, who's often going to a lot of remote areas on their own and it made it only about 4 meters tall when folded, like the X-1, which is less than half the size of a standard tie. And even unfolded, it was 3 meters shorter, at 5.7 meters or 18 feet 8 inches. The cost was 150,000 credits, making it 2.5 times the cost of a standard tie, and 10k less than the TIE Advanced X-1, while being equal to an X-Wing. It's crazy to think of, but the Scimitar was 55 million credits, but that's really comparing Banthas and Ewoks. That cost is due to its acceleration, hyperdrive, weaponry, and of course the cloaking. But with a top-down view, you can see how this section on both the V-1 and X-1 took their inspiration from the Scimitar. And the reason why these two TIE Advanced versions are close to the X-Wing in cost is mainly because of the hyperdrive capability. While the X-Wing was much faster, with the Class 1 being the fastest class in the galaxy, these TIEs had a Class 4.5 and 4, making it equal to some large cargo haulers. This may seem insanely slow, but keep in mind they didn't have to do hit and run style attacks like the Rebels, and if they were scrambling to a time sensitive target, they weren't doing it alone. The Empire would always throw a large force at any target, and even the Inquisitors are hardly ever fighting without backup. So these ties could be attached to anything from the Gazanti class to the decks of capital ships. And when it did arrive in atmosphere, the TIE Fighter was one of the fastest craft out there. While the X-1 used by Vader was equal to a standard TIE, the Inquisitor's V-1 maxed out at 1600 kilometers per hour or 960 miles per hour, making it 52% faster than the X-Wing, and one of the only craft out there faster than an A-Wing, though not when it comes to real space distances. This stat is referred to as megalite per hour, and it is a bit silly if you look at it too long, putting ships at multiple times the speed of light, but ignoring that and using it simply as a scale to measure ships relative to each other, we see that the A-Wing and ETA-2 are the only ships out there faster than the experimental ties, with a big jump in speed seen by the First Order era, likely just due to being 30 years later. Now this is all powered by twin ion engines, and would have likely looked a lot like your standard tie underneath those Durasteel panels. 
with Tabana gas getting ionized for the engines, and these massive power generators energizing the two LS 9.1 laser cannons. But what is most impressive are the variable munition launchers, which was used by the Grand Inquisitor to track vessels by running with an XX-23S thread tracker, which was powerful enough to transmit out of hyperspace. And this is the same model that would be used to track the Millennium Falcon to Yavin 4. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? The V-1 could be outfitted with missiles, which themselves could be a variety of missile types or mixed in with trackers for a total of 20 projectiles. The X-1 also had a launcher, and this combo really helped close the gap between the greater power of the old ARC-170s and the now enemy X-Wings. And in the same vein was the inclusion of a shield generator. The standard tie was known for being disposable, the military philosophy of putting citizens to good use as cannon fodder, having overwhelming forces, and tying the economy to military production. To the point that the pilots knew that even if they ejected and survived, it wouldn't be for long as they were left for dead out in space. This tie also had an ejection seat, but it adds onboard life support systems, so the pilot wasn't required to wear this whole oxygen system. The Inquisitor does wear his helmet, but this appears to be for augmented reality displays, because he takes it off when the target escapes, and when this gets commandeered, we see that it's not necessary. And in this same fight with the Ghost, as we saw with its great speed, it isn't that the ties couldn't overtake it, but that they only had forward-facing weapons, and hoped to overwhelm their shields. Open fire! The shields will not hold indefinitely. This problem was addressed by the First Order tie, placing a rear gunner with these extra cannons. And this is why something like the Ghost was so hard to take down, with turrets and even the detachable Phantom, and was why the ARC-170 was necessary for the swarms of droid fighters. When they do get some hits in rapid succession, not that this is unique to the TIE's weaponry, but we do get a good look at how droids connected to a ship, for purposes like in this case manning the cannons, the jolt of electricity that is absorbed by the ship when incoming energy bolts start breaking through the shield and dispersing over the armor and then into the ship, do a serious number on that connected droid. And moments later, we see just how bad it was. This mission was to capture Imperial Trader Sibo, who years earlier had volunteered to be augmented with the AJ-6 cyborg construct, and now could expose schematics for this new prototype starfighter, as well as the other variants being worked on, in addition to Walker schematics, Stormtrooper tactics, and the five-year plan for Lothal. This intel was so important that the Grand Inquisitor led the operation to bring Sibo in, forcing the rebel group the Spectres to make some dramatic decisions. With the tracker connected and broadcasting their position, even through the blue void of hyperspace, Space. Harrison Dula says that they could try and detach it, but interestingly, Kanan points out that because of their close call with this force-wielding pursuer, the Grand Inquisitor could now track them through the force. Why not just drop the Phantom into our trail and let the Imperials chase after their tracker? The Inquisitor is on our trail, and as long as Ezra and I are on board the Ghost, we're jeopardizing Sibo's escape. This is something we don't see depicted a lot, but it is one of the most dangerous aspects of being a Jedi survivor. And a dark, twisted part of Palpatine's plan is that even if they're not captured, merely knowing that they were hunted pushed so many survivors to choose to detach themselves from the Force. Combine this with knowing that heroics would attract attention, and you can see how the Inquisitorius removed the effect of the Jedi, even if they hadn't killed them all. So to pull them off the trail, the Jedi hop in the detachable Phantom, and perform a risky mid-hyper route ejection. As soon as it separates, it instantly starts to get pulled through the fabric of space-time and tumbles into real space. The abandoned old base is actually Fort Anaxis, the site of one of the largest final battles of the Clone Wars. And once inside of the hangar, we see just how hard it was to remove the tracker, eventually separating it and chucking it into the old LAAT gunship wreckage. The Empire always erred on the side of Overkill, and the Grand Inquisitor arrived via Lambda Transport with a squadron of troopers. The battle was intense, and the Jedi would have surely lost if it wasn't for Ezra's bond with the Furnox. You're not going near it! I believe I am. This brought them the chance to flee, and later that year, after they defeated the Grand Inquisitor, the duo would steal the prototype. The Inquisitor's tied! Well, we know he's not gonna use it. You know what, kid? worry me sometimes. They would use its superior speed to catch up to Hera and her stolen tie, blasting away several Imperial fighters before docking with their Gazanti to make the jump to safety. The ship's ultimate fate was to be disassembled and analyzed by the Rebel Alliance, looking for weaknesses in this ship and ties in general. With General Antok Merrick stating that Captain Heronar and his crew had a, quote, merry time taking the ship apart. Despite this loss, Imperial Command was evidently impressed by the ship's performance, going from prototype to the official tie of the Inquisitorius, used later by the fifth brother, seventh sister, and eighth brother, the latter having his hijacked by Chopper on Malachor, and then Maul would take it to leave Malachor. 
three years after this, in the same year as the Battle of Yavin, Year Zero, we get our last appearance of the V1 during the Battle of Fostar Haven. Lyndon Javes led a Helix Squadron during an operation overseen by Ray Sloan, and under the orders of Will of Tarkin, to hunt down the survivors of the destruction of Alderaan. A convoy of refugees was to be destroyed on sight, but this evil pushed Javes to defect, using the variable munitions launcher to hit his wingmates with ion torpedoes, allowing the convoy to escape, while he would join forces with Echo Squadron when they arrived to escort these Alderaanians. Of course, the sister ship, the TIE Advanced X-1, would continue to be used by Darth Vader during the Galactic Civil War. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for behind the scenes facts, this ship was brought into canon via Rebels, but was based on the TIE Advanced prototype of Legends, mentioned in the Imperial Handbook. There were no visual depictions, but it described the predecessor of the Advanced X-1 as being sleeker, a smaller silhouette, and having a compact wing panel configuration. It was also said to have been designed by Vader working along with Wraith Sinar, Sinar being the one who designed all the other ties and the scimitar, and these were to be given out to the Inquisitors and Dark Side Adepts. Canon stats mentioned come from the TIE Fighter Owner's Workshop Manual, with additional info coming from Ultimate Star Wars, The Rebel Files, and Dawn of Rebellion, while that game shown is Star Wars Squadrons. The best way to help me out is to hit that like button, share this video, and subscribe if you want to see more. Check out the links for free stuff and discounts, as well as links to our Patreon and PayPal, especially our $25 tier, Bill Payne, Oscar Jones, and Renee Flores. But most important of all, remember, never hit that eject button, and the Force will be with you, always.